All right, so I'm going through the uh, overlapping generations model slides. All right, so, uh, so far we have been looking at models of economic growth that make the point that capital accumulation isn't what's gonna drive long run growth, although it can drive short run growth. And of course, in these models, capital continues to accumulate as countries grow, but uh, if there's no population or technology growth, then there will be no long run growth. Okay, and then an upset. All right, so today what we're gonna look at is the uh, overlapping generations model, and I was happy to see that I actually, so these slides are, I'm modifying the slides that I wrote down last year, and I was happy to see that I was actually making this point uh, last year as well as this year, you know, I thought, I thought I was gonna have to add this point, but it turns out that I actually thought about it last year as well, because it's not that surprising. Um, that uh, there's this hidden social welfare assumption in the Solo and Ramsey growth model. We talked about it, I think, a little bit, um, which tells us how to think about uh, future people. So the issue is when we start time, you know, the population is growing, so it means that there's gonna be new people uh, you know, in 50 years and 100 years, how should we think about those people as a society? How much should we care about their welfare relative to the welfare of us, the people that are alive today? Uh, well, in this uh, in the Solo and Ramsey growth models, they had this assumption that we have households, and then households care about future generations of their family in a particular way. So you care about your children a certain amount. You know, you care about your grandchildren a little bit less than you care about your children, and you care about your grandchildren's children a little bit less, and so on and so on. That's the uh, that's this sort of discounting um, idea. If you think about it, it's a little bit weird because we're fixing the number of households, and then those households are growing over time, and they're getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and eventually you have households that are you know the size of countries. Uh, so it's a bit it's a bit weird, but you know it just allows us to think about. The welfare of future people in some particular way all right so today we're going to have a model that has a very different approach to thinking about future generations um we're gonna we're gonna have that each generation only cares about themselves they don't care about future people at all and then what happens is uh basically in every in every time period you're going to have two generations that are alive at the same time i should be careful not to get ahead of myself uh, okay, I think I can still talk about this a little bit more on this slide. Um, basically, you know, one generation doesn't care at all for the other generation. They don't care whether they're whether they starve or whether they're rich or whatever. They only care about themselves. Okay, and since they're alive for two periods, basically they're thinking, how well off am I going to be in period one, and how well off am I going to be in period two, and that's kind of it. So rather than thinking about households in this overlapping generations model, we're gonna be thinking about workers or people, just individual people or generations, if you like, since there's a representative agent and everyone is kind of the same. Okay, so um, why would we care about this OLG model? What would you use this overlapping generations model for? Well, it's actually a very standard model for thinking about pensions. Um, I'm going to come back a little bit to talk about one implication of the model and kind of towards the end of the slides. Um, it's a pension where there's, well, let me just say this. Suppose that there's no government. People are still going to save, right? I mean, they, they still want to eventually retire or more generally, you know, as you get older, maybe you don't want to, it's harder for you to work as hard or you're not as productive. So you'll want to save some of your output from your productive years to fund your consumption in your less productive older years, potentially. But it turns out that without the government, the market can actually allocate and potentially can allocate too much savings or too much capital stock so that people are sort of saving too much when they're young. Um, and it happens uh, if uh, wages are high relative to the uh, capital rental rate. Um, if that's the case, then the young people have to really save a lot when they're productive in order to smooth consumption over their whole lives. So if that's the case, then it turns out that the government actually, if it implements its own sort of pension program with forced savings, it can actually, um, it can actually do better than the market. Here, forced savings means 
they're going to force people to save less than they would like to. Okay, so it's a little bit different than what we see in the real world, but still, um, the government can sort of, if they can force people to, if it can choose people's savings, it can actually do better for every single generation. It can increase consumption for every generation. Um, and that's kind of an interesting implication maybe. Um, yeah. So we'll talk about that when we get to the slides. No reason to say more about it right now. All right, so um, what's the model look like? Looks like this. Uh, well, for the first thing, time is gonna be discrete. So in the book, for better or worse, the models sort of jump between continuous time and discrete time. Uh, again, remember continuous time means that time can be any real number. We can talk about what happens at time 3.5, or we can talk about what happens at time pi, or any, any real number. It doesn't really, I mean, whether time is discrete, you know, 0, 1, 2, 3, or time is continuous, it doesn't really affect the implications of the models. It's just sometimes more convenient notation-wise to look at uh, continuous time or discrete time. It's a little bit too bad that the textbook jumps back and forth. I know actually um, another one of my colleagues who teaches macro uh, at a master's level actually switched test textbooks this year from Romer to another textbook simply because, not because Romer is a bad textbook, but simply because he thought it was confusing the way that Romer switches between continuous and discrete time. So we'll see how that goes and think about it um, maybe potentially in the future for this course, but not this year. So anyway, time is discrete. And uh, in the OLG model, it'd be hard to think about how you do it otherwise, because I guess you could have people living for two continuous time periods, but then it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a little bit weird. Uh, this one I think maybe has to be discrete. Um, so yeah, so everybody's gonna live for two periods. In one period, people are gonna be young, and in the, sec in the next period, people are gonna be old. Okay, so uh, a certain number of individuals are born at each time period T. We're gonna assume that people are going to work for one unit of labor when young, and they're not gonna work when old. Okay, so um, they're endowed with one, I mean, another way to say it is, they're endowed with one unit of labor when they're young, and they have no labor endowment when they're old, and if they don't use it, the labor endowment when they're young, it just disappears, it depreciates away. Okay, then, it's, then that would make it optimal. So then they're optimizing. Okay, so since two generations are gonna be alive at each period of time, we're just gonna kind of assume that at time t, there's gonna be one young generation, which we're gonna label one. We could have also labeled it y, but I think it's just easier to have one and two. Um, and then also at time t, there's another generation that's still alive. It's the old generation. We're gonna label that two, okay? So C1t is the period t consumption of the young who are alive at period t. And then C2t is the consumption of the old people alive at time t, okay? Production function, we're gonna have very little to say about it. It's gonna come back again at the end when we think about, you know, wages and the rental rate of capital, but basically constant returns to scale and it has the conditions. Um, that's really all there is to say about that. Utility functions are gonna be just like they were in, uh, in the neoclassical growth model, constant relative risk aversion. You'll see that on the next slide. And finally, the last thing we have to talk about is how does capital accumulate? So of course, just like in the neoclassical growth model, capital is gonna be owned by what we used to call households, now we're calling them workers. Um, so basically, capital at time T is gonna be the savings of what the generation, the old generation who's, uh, who's alive at time T saved when they were young at time T minus one. And we're just gonna assume that, you know, what's produced is just macroeconomic jelly, and then either you consume it or you, uh, turn it into these savings, okay. And it's one for one, right? So if you, uh, 
So if you produced three units of macroeconomic jelly, then you, maybe you consume two units and you save one unit would be an example. And then the next period, you'll have one unit of capital. Okay, so uh, that's kind of the setup of the model. Now we're gonna write down the preferences of the worker and we're gonna solve for the worker's optimal savings. That's really the only choice the worker makes is how much, how much to save. Uh, depending on the rate of return on capital and the wages. So, of course, the wages kind of matter for when the workers are young and the rate of return from the worker's perspective matters for uh, when they're old. Okay. So, here are preferences. They're very similar to what we saw before, CRRA. The only difference is that there's only two periods here, right? So, previously we had some sort of um, continuous time utility function where we are summing, remember it looks something like this, C of T one minus divided by one minus theta. And then I think here we had a discount PT. And that was like the household utility function. And then I think we had, we had also some labor in here as well. So this was a utility per worker. I just make it the same as I had before. Since it was households, uh, let's see here. That was the discount rate. And then we also had the number of household members. So LT divided by H, right? So here's the number of household members at time T. Here's the discount factor. And then here's the utility per member. Um, and then we had a DT here, All right? So that was the old version of the uh, utility function for the household. This is the new version of the utility function for workers. It's now it's a, or, you know, workers in a particular generation, a representative worker. And you'll notice that it looks very similar, but it's, the difference is there's only two periods. Here's period one when they're young, and here's period two when they're old. Okay. Of course, we don't have to worry about this population growth because now we're not thinking of a dynasty. We're just thinking of a particular worker. Um, so there's no growth of population in here, but, um, there is a discount. We're just going to discount in a slightly different way. Uh, so a worker is going to, uh, weight utility in period two, slightly less than they weight utility. Well, I should, I should be careful here. They're going to weight it differently than they weight utility in period one. Okay. And whether they rate it, weight, uh, weight it more or less depends on the size of row. So the higher is rho, the uh, greater is the weight that individuals place on first period utility. Okay, so you can think if rho here is approaching infinity, then people don't care about period two utility at all. They only care about period one utility. If rho is zero, then people weight the two utility in the two periods the same. And if rho is you know, negative, getting closer and closer to negative one, which means that this uh, term is blowing up, getting closer to infinity, then basically they care less and less about utility in period one. Okay, so that's the utility function. What about the budget constraint? So I'm only gonna use it on this one slide, so I haven't even defined it. I think we, should get, we could just call this savings, you know, saving, I'm not even gonna put it, I was gonna put a subscript on it for time, but I think it's clear, just leave it as it is. So what does a worker save? Well, it depends on the wage and then the amount of human capital per worker at time T. That's when the worker is young. Okay, so this is the earnings of a single worker who has one unit of labor. They're selling one unit of labor. What's the price? Well, it's, uh, it's the wage. But remember this little WT, the way we defined it previously, is the wage per unit of human capital. Uh, or it's, well, I think it was the wage per... I'll, I'll just leave it there. It's the wage per unit of human capital. So we're multiplying times the uh, number of units of human capital that a worker has at time T. Okay, so this is like the total amount of income or macroeconomic jelly, if you like, that the worker has to decide what to do with. So they can either consume it or they can save it. If they consume it, then we subtract off their consumption uh, and 
we end up with the amount of capital they'll have in period two. Okay, so what's consumption in period two? Well, they're gonna get a rate of return on their capital. That's just the rental rate of capital of period T plus one. They're gonna take this capital and, and um, they're going to loan it to firms. So they get this return on it. And then why is there a one here as well? Well, when they're done, you know, they're gonna to die tomorrow. So they basically want to consume all of their, of their capital stock. Okay, so again, it's kind of macroeconomic jelly. It can either be, uh, it can either be capital or it can be consumption. So what this says is, in period two, workers have this much capital or this much macroeconomic jelly. Jelly, let's say it's capital first. They rent, they loan it to firms. Firms pay them a, a rental rate of R T plus one times the amount of capital that the firm borrowed. So workers get that back, plus they get back their original investment. And then they're going to consume all of that okay when they're old and they have no labor income because when they're old they don't work all right so if we rearrange it i mean we have here we have a uh if we just rearrange this equation actually this whole thing then we get this with some simple algebra so i won't rewrite it um so there so that's what you get as a budget constraint Consumption in period one plus discounted, discounted with the rate of return in T plus one consumption in period two um, has to equal the earnings of workers in period one when they're productive. Okay, so now I have a question here. What happens to capital when a generation dies? You know, in the real world, suppose that uh, someone dies, you know, maybe they own a house, maybe they have some investments. What happens to that, that capital? Well, in the real world, what happens is often they give it to someone, right? So they give it to their children, they give it to uh, their spouse, whatever. Uh, but in this model, we don't have to worry about that. Why is that? Because in period, when people are old, they basically consume all of their capital. So when they die, there's no capital left over. This is a perfect foresight model. There's no surprise death. That's that. So I guess the answer is it doesn't matter because there's no capital left over when someone dies. So I'll just write that here. It doesn't matter. My blue is a little bit too thick. My pen is a little bit too thick. Okay, so now we've got the utility function for a worker. We've got the budget constraint for a worker. So now we can solve the worker's problem, okay? Don't think there's anything else to say in this slide. Um, let's think about how to solve this in a couple of ways. So I've got sort of an intuitive way and a uh, formal way, okay? So the intuitive way is actually what they talk about in the textbook and I think it's great, it is, it is intuitive, so let's, let's just say it. How do we solve this problem? Well, um, let's consider a worker who's at the optimal level of savings, okay? Now let's suppose that we take this worker and we say, what happens if this person saves just a little bit more? Okay, so they consume just a little bit less today and then they consume just a little bit more tomorrow, okay? So how does that work? Well, if they, can, if they, if they, can, if they, uh, if they decrease their consumption today by delta, Okay, this is the Greek letter capital delta. If they, um, if they reduce consumption today by delta, well, then tomorrow they can use that macroeconomic jelly. Well, they can, first they can consume whatever they didn't consume today, right? So their consumption tomorrow is gonna to be delta plus the returns they got by renting the capital to, or uh, loaning the capital to the firms at T plus one. Okay, so if they decrease consumption by negative delta, or they decrease consumption by delta today, then tomorrow they can actually increase consumption by one plus RT plus one times delta, all right? So we know that this trade can't make someone better off. Why is that? Because if it could, then they would have done it. We're assuming that they started at the optimal level of um, the utility maximizing level of savings, all right? So um, we know that um, 
if we take marginal utility uh, in period one, multiply it times negative delta, and add marginal utility in, in period two, that's this, marginal utility in period two, times the uh, increase in consumption, then that has to be zero. Okay, so this argument here said, uh, you know, this, this can't make people better off, right? So that says that um, this can't be greater than zero. Okay, so our argument a second ago said that this can't be greater than zero. Can't be like this. Uh, I've got to write this better. Can't be greater than zero, right? This trade can't make the person better off. But it also can't be less than zero. Why is that? Because um, if it's less than zero, we can just assume that instead of decreasing consumption uh, today, maybe I actually increase consumption. So maybe delta here itself was negative so that um, this was actually an increase in consumption today. And this here is a decrease in consumption tomorrow. Um, then, you know, that also can't make this less than zero. <laughs> Right, so if delta is positive, what this says is, um, if delta is positive and this is greater than zero, then what it says is that I can increase my utility by decreasing consumption in period one a tiny amount. If uh, delta is positive and this relationship is negative, what this relationship says is that I can increase my utility by increasing my consumption in period one a small amount and decreasing my consumption in period two a small amount. Neither of those can be true because we've assumed that people are optimizing, okay? And I haven't actually shown you that this is marginal utility in period one and that this is marginal utility in period two, but you can figure that out yourself simply by going back to this slide and taking the derivative of these terms with respect to consumption. Okay, so um, if you buy my argument here, then let me scroll down a bit here. Then we can use this equation to derive what's called the Euler equation, which relates consumption in period two to consumption in period one. This ratio to the interest rate or the rate of return on well, the rental rate of capital in period T plus one to the discount rate, uh, that the, the you know, psychological discount rate of the consumer. And then this little guy here, which you'll recall is the intertemporal elasticity of substitution or the elasticity of intertemporal substitution. Okay, so that was the informal version. I hope that that was intuitive. I confused myself a little bit there for a second, but I think if you think through it, you'll see why that, uh, that relationship has to equal zero. Um, the formal version is just to set up this Lagrangian function. Here's the consumer's utility function. Here's the consumer's budget constraint. Okay. Here is the, uh, the Lagrange multiplier. Okay. So if you take the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to consumption in the first period, you'll get that marginal utility has to equal the Lagrange multiplier. If you take the derivative with respect to consumption in the second period, you'll get that discounted marginal utility in, in period two has to equal, or I should say marginal utility in period two has to equal the Lagrange multiplier divided by one plus the rental rate of capital in period T plus one. Okay. Combining these equ two equations by, um, by eliminating the Lagrange multiplier, basically just taking this guy and putting him here, uh, you're going to get this expression, okay? And then you can already see that if you um, if you just multiply both sides by one plus rho, 
and then divide both sides by C1. I'll, I'll just write it out. So this is going to give us C to the negative theta to T plus 1 divided by C1 T to the negative theta is equal to 1 plus rho divided by 1 plus R T plus 1. Okay, then um, let's let's uh, raise both sides to the power negative one divided by theta, and then we'll get I'll just say C two here. C one will get rid of the t's because it's just uh, too much notation. C one is equal to one plus R T divided by uh, t plus one. <laughs> I started to get rid of the t's and then I just put that in again. One plus rho. One divided by theta. Okay. Which I believe, if I flip back one slide here, you will see that that is indeed our Euler equation. Okie doke. Okay, so we can rearrange the Euler equation. Uh, just to multiply both sides by C1T, we get this thing right here. So what does that do? That relates consumption in period two, when people are old, to consumption in period one. And you'll see that this relationship pretty much for consumers depends on one thing. That's the rate of return on, uh, on capital, or alternatively, the rental rate of capital in uh, period T plus one. So, you know, a question is, does this mean consumption is increasing or decreasing? Well, that depends on whether this uh, rental rate of capital in T plus one is greater than or less than rho, basically. And it kind of makes sense, right? So, I mean, if I'm, if I'm very impatient, then you might expect that consumption will be falling in period when I'm old, right? So if, if one plus rho is very high, that means that I don't care much about my consumption when I'm old. Well, that means that consumption is gonna be falling. Uh, on the other hand, if uh, there's really, really great investment opportunities and the rate of, and the rental rate of capital at, at period T plus one, you know, we have firms that are very productive, um, then uh, that means that my consumption will be growing. Okay. Okay. So um, out of the consumer's problem, we got the Euler equation that has to do with the consumer's optimal savings or optimal consumption in period one and period two when they're young, when they're old. And then um, we also have their lifetime budget constraint. Okay. And we have two unknowns. One is period one, uh, period one consumption, period two consumption. Um, let's figure out what those are. Okay, so what, we, what what's the goal here? We want to figure out what is uh, consumption in period one as a function of wages and the rental rate of capital. We want to know what is consumption in period two as a function of wages and the uh, rental rate of capital. Okay. So let's just write out these two equations. So this one on top here, this is the lifetime budget constraint. It says that my consumption in period two is just my savings in period one times uh, the rental rate of capital period T plus one plus uh, my original investment, okay? And then here we have a relationship between C1 and C2 based on the consumer's sort of optimization problem, their optimal savings rate, okay? How do we solve it? Well, let's substitute one of the equations into the other one. So what we're going to do is take this left, this right hand side here, and we're going to put it on the left hand side there. Basically, we get this relationship doing some algebra, which I guess is clear enough from what's on the slide. We, uh, we will be able to isolate consumption period one. And we get this nice relationship, right? So like I said, we want consumption period one as a function of uh, I said the rental rate of capital at period T plus one, wages at period T, of course, human capital available at period T. And then also I didn't mention this, but one more parameter, well, two more parameters, the discount factor and the uh, elasticity of intertemporal substitution. Okay. Yep. 
once we have uh, consumption in period one, it's very easy for us to figure out what consumption in period two is, since we have uh, these equations up here. You know, just plug in consumption in period one there, and you'll get consumption in period two. Okay. Okay, so if we define SR as the savings rate, then um, then first of all, we can just, I mean, this is just a definition, so what is what is the savings rate? Well, it's, it's going to be consumption in period one. Well, it's just one minus the savings rate. So it's what is consumption in period one? It's the total amount that I earned in period one minus the amount that I saved. So uh, savings, of course, has to go from zero to one. And if we write this out, so, you know, we actually have a definition of C1T. So I'll flip back one slide. Here's our definition of C1T right here. Okay, so now if we just kind of use that and then this definition, we can isolate S here. So, you know, that's a lot of steps to ask you to do. So I'm actually gonna do it up here. So uh, C1T from this last slide, maybe actually I've got room so I can just see it. All right, so C1T is, let's see here. A T W T. Let's actually get rid of the T's, they're not important, and it's just gonna make things more notation intensive. All right, it's A W one plus rho to the power one over theta divided by one plus rho to the power one over theta plus one plus R to the power, and a little bit different here, one minus theta divided by theta. Okay. And here we're setting this equal to one minus S A W. Okay, well, A W is gonna cancel here. All right, so S is gonna equal one minus this whole big term, one plus rho. All right, you can kind of see here, we're gonna multiply one by, we're gonna change this one to one plus rho to the one divided by theta plus one plus r to the one minus theta divided by theta, okay? If we do that, you can see that this first one plus rho to the power one divided by theta is gonna drop out. So we're gonna get, let's see here, one plus r to the power one minus theta divided by theta divided by the same thing, one plus rho, one divided by theta, plus one plus r, one minus theta divided by theta, lots of notation, which is da, 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 exactly what we had down here. Okay, so that's where we got that. Definition of the savings rate is a function of the rental rate of capital in period t plus one. So here's my question. If we increase the rate of return on capital, let's say we increase it to something very, very high, something approaching infinity, what happens to consumption in period one? Okay, so first let's think about this intuitively, and then we'll think about it in terms of the equation of this model. Okay, so suppose that you learned today that there was gonna be extremely high returns on your investments, on your savings today. All right, how's that gonna affect your consumption today? Well, it depends, right? I mean. From one point of view, you think, well, you know, even conditional on whatever you save today, um, you're rich tomorrow, right? So maybe what you want to do actually is consume more today. In fact, maybe you want to really increase your consumption a lot today because you're going to be super rich tomorrow. Even if you don't save anymore, you just keep your current savings. By the way, an important point in this model, I didn't mention it yet, but basically people don't borrow, right? I mean, people save when they're young, and then they consume when they're old. So um, 
So there's no borrowing there. So imagine you were in this situation, you have some savings. You suddenly learn that the rate of return is super high. So you're super rich tomorrow. Well, maybe you want to actually really increase your consumption a lot today. That could be. Or alternatively, maybe you're very, very patient and you think, well, if I, for every little bit that I save today, I'm really going to be able to consume a lot tomorrow. Well, in that case, maybe you actually want to decrease your consumption today. Okay. So, um, actually both of those things can be, can be possibilities in this model and we can see it mathematically here. So how does this work? Suppose that theta is, let's see here, greater than one. That means that, uh, as we increase our, uh, as we increase the rate of return, this term here, it's going to be getting closer and closer to zero. All right. So that means that the savings rate is going to be getting closer and closer to zero, which means that consumption is going to be getting closer and closer to earnings um, today. All right. By the way, that, that's the one that seems more reasonable to me. I think typically we think that this theta is probably greater than one. But anyway, suppose that theta is less than one. Uh, theta has to be greater than zero by assumption, but suppose theta is less than one. That means that as the interest rate gets higher and higher and higher, as the uh, rental rate of capital gets higher and higher and higher, um, these, this term here and this term here are both getting very close to infinity, right? This term here, it's just staying constant. So this whole thing here, this whole term is approaching one, right? This term, that term are getting really, really big. This term is staying constant. It means the savings rate is approaching one, which means that consumption period when people are young is actually going to zero. People want to save everything. Okay, so both of these two po things are possibilities and they depend on the parameter theta, which governs basically this uh, elasticity of intertemporal substitution, a utility function parameter. Okay, so uh, there's more discussion here, very similar. So basically, um, savings are increasing in the rate of return on capital if and only if theta here is less than one which means that um, people really react a lot to changes in, um, in the rental rate of capital to prices, basically. Um, when theta is very high, on the other hand, which maybe is, maybe is more realistic, um, then what I say here is that the income effect dominates, which means that um, in period one, I'm not swayed by the fact that my return is going to be very high on any investments. I'm actually uh, swayed by the fact that I've become very rich tomorrow. So I want to consume more today because I want my consumption to be high in both periods. Okay. So it turns out that um, there's a special case when theta is exactly equal to one, which is, if you recall from our discussion last class, logarithmic utility. So that means utility is just equal to log of C. Then, um, then the savings rate is independent of R. Actually, this is like a little u. This is like the period utility function. Okay. So let's see what that looks like. We're actually going to use that special case, uh, not on this slide, but on the next one. So let's take a look at the dynamics of capital. How's that going to work? Well, um, capital is just going to be. So this is now aggregate. So this is like the total economy. What does capital look like in the economy? Why are we thinking about that? Well, we want to think about the uh, rental rate of capital. Okay, we want to think about the firm's problem. You know, we solved the consumer's problem given prices, but now we want to solve sort of the whole economy's path of growth. So we want to sort of figure out what those prices are. Right? And it's going to depend on the firm's technology and then the, the rate of return on capital and the rate of return on labor. Uh, rate of return on capital, the rental rate of capital and the uh, rental rate of labor. So wages and this, uh, this R, this interest rate. So anyway, um, what is the capital stock going to look like at period T plus one? Well, it's going to be the earnings of each worker times the number of workers times the savings rate of each worker. Okay. Which depends of course on the, on the rental rate of capital at T plus one. Okay. So now, just like in the uh, two models we looked at earlier, the solar growth model, also the neoclassical growth model, we're going to define little k t plus one to be 
big KT divided by units of human capital. Okay, if we do that, then um, little KT plus one, looking at this relationship here, well, we're still gonna have this savings rate. We're still gonna have the uh, wage rate here, but now we've eliminated AT and LT. How do we do that? Well, AT, LT divided by AT plus one, LT plus one. See, that's, so here we've got ATLT, here we've got AT plus one, LT plus one. Well, that's equal to ATLT, AT one plus G. Okay, the growth rate of, of um, technology exogenous is G. So this says that at time T plus one, the amount of technology we have is just AT times one plus G. And then the amount of labor we have is just LT times one plus N. Okay. A gets canceled, L gets canceled. So we end up with one over one plus G, one plus N. So we've, we've replaced uh, ATLT with one divided, uh, ATLT divided by AT plus one, LT plus one by one divided by one plus N times one plus G. Okay, so that's as far as we can get without putting on our macro cap and replacing something from the consumer's problem. Okay, remember the savings rate comes from the consumer's problem. Okay, so this is replacing an optimal decision from the consumer's problem, which depends on the rental rate of uh, capital and then also the, the wage. We're replacing that with the firm's problem, which is rental rate of capital at time t plus one is equal to f prime little k t plus one. This is using a result from our previous lectures. And wage is, is optimal from the firm's perspective is equal to f minus little k f prime of t. All right. So we talked about this several times. This one is kind of direct. This is the marginal product of capital. And this is, you know, informally, this is production minus the marginal product of capital times capital, right? That's what's left over for the, uh, the workers, okay? So looking, at, looking up here, looking down here, um, we're just replacing S of R with S of F prime of little kt plus one. And then here we're replacing WT with uh, F of little KT minus KT times F prime of little KT, okay? Okay, so why is this good? Why is this, uh, why is this useful for us? It's relating little KT plus one to little KT and a bunch of parameters, right? So um, there's parameters in the production function, there's parameters in the savings, rate decision of workers. Um, and then of course we've got G and N here, which are also parameters, but that's it, right? They're parameters that we set when we start analyzing the model. Okay. It's not quite as clean as what we've had in our other models, because in our other models, we've had little KT plus one on the left-hand side, and we've had little KT on the right-hand side. Um, that makes things cleaner. Unfortunately here for us, we can't do that. We've got little kt plus one on the left-hand side and also on the right-hand side, and then little kt on the right-hand side. Okay, so we're actually going to, just kind of to make our analysis easier to start with, we're gonna use this special case of log utility when theta is equal to one. Again, this is the period utility function, like a little ut, period utility function, utility. I should maybe change that to a little u on the slide. I think I'll do that. But anyway, um, you can kind of see how this works. So suppose that theta is equal to one, then this is just zero. So this term actually kind of just turns into one. And this term also just turns into one. So we actually get one over, oh, and then of course theta is equal to one, right? So this is just one plus, so this term also cancels out. So you just get one over one plus rho plus one, which you know, add up the ones, you get one over two plus rho. 
Okay, so that's one assumption. The savings rate becomes very simple. It's just one over two plus rho. Again, kind of makes sense. Think that uh, when, when rho is very high, it means people don't care about what's happening to them tomorrow, what their utility looks like tomorrow. So in this case, they're going to save less. Okay. We're also going to assume that production is Cobb Douglas. So we can write little fk as little k to the power alpha. Again, this is a result from our last several lectures. So you can review by looking at them. Uh, and then you know, f prime of k is just alpha times k to the power alpha minus one. Okay. We've got all this stuff. We can actually plug it into our evolution of capital from the last slide. So it looks like this. So this is the this is from a couple of slides ago. This is just the evolution of capital. Now let's plug in our savings rate given log utility. It's just one over two plus rho. Again, doesn't depend on on r. Doesn't depend on the rental rate of capital. And then here uh, for the Cobb Douglas production technology. We, um, we just have little k to the power alpha, and then um, and then here for the uh, f prime of little kt, we've got alpha times kt to the power alpha minus one. Okay, so you'll notice that here we have a little kt, here we have a little kt to the power alpha minus one, so we can actually combine those into just a kt to the power alpha, and we end up with, you know, pulling that outside, we end up with a little kt alpha, times one minus alpha. Okay, so this is our final relationship is that little kt plus one is equal to some constant that is less than one. Oh, actually I can even make that line a little longer. Some constant that is less than one times uh, little kt to the power alpha. So at the end of the day, what's it gonna look like? Well, alpha is some number that's less than one and greater than zero. So we're going to have a kt here, we're going to have a kt plus one there, and we're going to have some function that looks like this, some concave function. So here it is. This here is kt to the power alpha. This line is just kt is equal to kt plus one. Scroll down a little bit so you guys can see the axis there. So this is just the 45 degree line. What is that useful for? It just changes kt plus one into kt or kt into kt plus one. So how do we want to think about the dynamics of capital? People only live for two periods, but the economy keeps going on, keeps chugging along. Okay. Um, so if we start with a capital level of k zero, then our kt plus one is going to be equal to little kt, little k zero, to the power alpha times some constant, okay? That's less than one. So actually this is, I should be careful here. This is little kt to the power alpha times a constant which I will call b, and b is less than one. That turns it into, so that's capital at time t plus one. Now let's change this level of capital at time t plus one, let's change that into capital at time t. We can do, do that by reflecting this 45 degree line back to here. That's the, you know, these two points are the same. Here's little k1, here's little k1. Okay, so what's little k2 gonna be? Boom. Up here. Um, then we just kind of reflect little k2 back to time t, just like that. And then we just keep doing this process and it's gonna keep kind of going like that down there. Okay, um, I should be a little bit careful here. Um, the zeros here refer to t's, not the generations, right? So I've used zero and one to refer to young, or young and old generations, uh, you know, alive at a particular time. Here, zero, one, two refer to times. I got this picture from the book. If I was making it myself, maybe I would change this to something. I might say, I might actually call this t plus one. This would be t plus one. This would be t plus two. T plus one, t plus two. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> that should have been kt. 
ok suppose you were to start down here you'd play the same game except for now you're going to be going this direction so there's again with this particular example there's a almost unique equilibrium of course there's always this sort of unstable equilibrium at zero but you know that's a special case right more generally anything can happen in these in these models um, why is that because there can be a very complicated relationship between f prime the function s and then this relationship here you know this one depends on little kt plus one and this one depends on little kt so all sorts of weird stuff can happen you can get um, situations that look like all of these things so um, let's each of them sort of well this is the one we just looked at oh no this, this is not the one we just looked at um, each of them is sort of different than the very standard easy case we just analyzed let's make this even smaller so um, with this case, we have a stable equilibrium, another stable equilibrium, and then an unstable equilibrium. So we have three sort of non-zero equilibria. Um, why do I call this one unstable? Because if you go a little bit to the left here, then we're going to start our, our little process where we sort of converge to this guy. If I go a little bit to the right of this guy, then we're going to start our process that's going to make us converge to this guy. So any small perturbation from this point is going to lead us to a different equilibrium. Okay. Um, however, if we are at the level of capital uh, K star two, then we're going to stay there forever. Okay. But if we just deviate just a tiny little bit, we're going to move to a different one. Um, in this example, there is no equilibrium other than zero. So we go like this. That can happen as well. There can be no non-zero equilibrium level or steady state equilibrium in these models. Here uh, we have, well, here we had more than three equilibria, right? Because we had this equilibrium here as well, another unstable equilibrium. Here we have exactly three equilibria. So I thought there was a result that said you always have an odd number of equilibria. But here it looks like we have four. Okay, well, I guess it's not true in this model. Um, but anyway, uh, here we have three. It's very similar to an analysis here. It's just we don't have this little list one here. Um, and then here, this is an even more pathological case. Here we don't even have a unique equilibrium. Okay, because what you, what you see here is that um, if we start with capital level A, anything from capital level A to capital level B, either people say this much, that is utility maximizing given, given wages and, and rates of return, or there's different wages and different rates of return and people uh, save this much capital, or there's different rate wages and rates of return. People save this much capital, so there's no unique level. It's just, you know, it depends if we if wages are a certain level, then people save a certain amount, which which rationalizes wages being that level. But there's three possible levels which all satisfy uh, the conditions of the model. So, uh, you know, basically anything can happen depending on what's the uh, production technology and what's the savings behavior or how does the savings behavior depend on the uh, rates of return okay so uh, regardless of what I just said as long as we're at a steady state other than the one at zero then the implications are similar to those in the solo growth model or the neoclassical growth model that uh, the, the economy is growing at rate n plus g okay so Output per worker is going to be growing at G, just like in those in those models. I mean, it just comes from this. It just comes from this definition. 
right? So if this is growing at, at rate n plus g, then that has to be growing also at rate n plus g. You should be a little bit careful here. Use of the word rate. But I'm just going to leave it at that. I'm just going to leave it at that. Okay, so um, that's kind of the main major analysis of the model. So now let's talk a little bit about what we can say about this model, some sort of maybe interesting implications. So the first thing is, how do we really, you know, the people inside of our model, the individuals inside of the, our model, they're very selfish, they only care about themselves, but you know, we're sort of outside of the model and we can think how should we care about different generations you know we ourselves might have some sort of social preference as the planners of the economy about trade-offs between earlier generations and later generations you know suppose that suppose this were a good model of the world and we were worried about climate change you know we, we might want to think how much do we care about people that are alive today and how much do we care about people that are alive tomorrow, even if those people themselves don't care about, um, about other generations than their own. Okay, so what we're gonna ask here is, you know, that's a difficult problem. We're not gonna tackle it, how we should weight trade-offs. Let's at least think about a minimum criterion. Let's think about Pareto efficiency. So um, what is Pareto efficiency? I'm gonna say on the next slide. Um, but generally it says something like if there's some intervention we can do that makes no one worse off and makes at least someone or one generation in our context better off, then that should be something we should do. Okay. Uh, it turns out that in this model, the market equilibrium is not necessarily Pareto efficient. In the other models we've looked at, uh, the market equilibrium was Pareto efficient. Well, in the solo Earth model, there's no real market equilibrium, so it doesn't. We can't really say that the market equilibrium was Pareto efficient. There was no market equilibrium uh, in the neoclassical growth model. In the neoclassical growth model, the market equilibrium is efficient. It's just that the um, the equilibrium level of capital is lower than the um, golden rule lever level of, of capital relative to human capital. Um, but it's perfectly efficient in the sense that households are doing as well as they can given prices and, and uh, there's no way that a social planner could make things better. Um, there's, there's gonna be sort of an, I'll, I'll kind of, I'll say a little bit more about that in just two slides because that's also gonna be true here. Um, if people are saving too little, then actually the market equilibrium is Pareto efficient because if we force them to save more, then we're lowering consumption of the first generation. You see what I'm saying? So that's that's actually true also in the um, in the neoclassical growth model. You'll recall that in the neoclassical growth model, I think I said this, um, the equilibrium level of savings is always less than the golden rule level of savings. Okay, so first let me just say something about this Pareto criterion. I think it's a very interesting thing to talk about. So sometimes people say that, I mean, I don't, I don't know if people actually say this, but um, you might claim that economics is value-free because the only uh, interventions that we, really strongly, that we really strongly support as economists are things that are value-free in the sense that it's only using the Pareto criterion, which seems very, very hard to criticize. So what the Pareto criterion says, and I think to put this in sort of a general and a fair way, is that if everyone, all of the agents in an economy and like a social planner or whatever, if everyone prefers the situation A to situation B, then, then we, the social planner, should prefer situation A, right? 
I might want to add the word strictly there, right? So if everyone prefers situation A to situation B, um, and also someone strictly prefers situation A to situation B, one person at least, then socially we should do situation A. Okay, it's hard to think of counterexamples. Maybe if we have time, an example is uh, Amartya Sen's example of the impossibility of a Pradian liberal. So if people have preference over what other people do, um, then you can have it where these two, these two um, ways of evaluating society sort of don't fit together well. So a, a Paredian says that if everyone prefers a situation, then that situation is better. A liberal says there's some things that individuals should be able to decide themselves. So for instance, what color, uh, you know, do I read a book or not? You know, that's none of your business whether I read a book or not. You might prefer that I read it or you might prefer that I don't read it. But the liberal says that's none of your business. I should be the one to decide whether I read that book or not, etc. So um, those two things don't mesh well together and they both seem like reasonable criteria for what we should prefer as a society. You know, freedom versus preferences type of thing. But anyway, uh, I'm not going to say it now. Uh, Maybe I'll make a, if I have time, maybe I'll make a little uh, note about it on YouTube. In any case, uh, you know, I think it's true that it is hard to criticize the Pareto criterion, but you should be careful about what we're actually saying when we're looking at economics models. Because for instance, in the economics model that we just wrote down, all people care about is their own consumption. All right. In the real world, people have preferences that are not only about their own consumption. So when we're making a statement about a Pareto efficient outcome in our model, you know, that, that may or may not generalize because we're not describing preferences that are necessarily realistic. And then I have an example here. You know, in our model, people don't care one little bit about other people's consumption, whether it's high, whether it's low. They only care about their own consumption. In the real world, if we were to make the top 1% or the top 0.1%, right? Those are the Piketty's, you know, these uber rich people that have lives of extreme, you know, very, very wealthy people. Um, if we were to make them, you know, if you could choose, you could push a button that said, should we make these people 10 times richer than they are today and not change anyone else else's income? Or should we not do that? I think many people would not push that button. But, you know, at least based on this sort of very narrow preferences over consumption, that change would be socially optimal in the sense that, uh, you know, we're increasing some people's consumption and uh, not reducing anybody else's, right? So, I mean, you can see that's an example of how our real preferences, you know, in our real human preferences, we do care about inequality. And we do have preferences over other people's consumption. Um, you know, in our model, we're sort of abstracting from that. So it's not quite, it's, it's a bit of a strong uh, claim to make that economics, oh, I just realized it says econonomics. <laughs> um, it's a bit of a strong assumption to make that, um, that it's value free because the very fact that we're only including own consumption in someone's utility function is already making quite a strong assumption about people's preferences. Okay. That's all I'm going to say about that. Now let's step back and think about the model that we did write down where people only care about their own preferences. Let's return to this Cobb Douglas log utility world. So let's recall that uh, the evolution of capital looks like this. So in our equilibrium, we can just substitute in a K star here. You know, we can substitute in a little k star here, we can substitute in a little k star here, and uh, solve it. You'll end up with this nice little uh, relationship, which says that little k star is at some level. Uh, now let's figure out what is the, uh, what's the rate of return in this model. It looks like this, so you know, you can say that r star, the rate of return in in a steady state is given by this guy here. 
So far, so good. What's wrong with that? We can easily write that out. Now, let's think about something we looked at in the solar growth model. What's the consumption maximizing level of savings? We can figure that out in this, in this economy as well. Here we have abstracted from uh, capital depreciation. We have assumed that capital doesn't depreciate. If we put in capital depreciation, it wouldn't change anything. We just have another delta here, no problem. So um, we're still gonna have a, a, a total amount of production in the economy. We're still gonna have a break-even level of, um, of investment. When little k star is constant, then it, uh, when little k is constant, it implies that uh, the savings rate times little k minus the break-even level investment has to equal zero. That didn't change. Um, ah, wrote that wrong a little bit. Times production minus break-even level of capital has to be constant. This has to equal zero because otherwise our little k dot would be not equal to zero, basically. I mean, this is the continuous time version, but you know, the difference version of this uh, would uh, also be true. So basically, this equation still holds. And if this equation still holds, then this equation holds as well, which is the um, consumption maximizing level of uh, of savings is going to be the one where the uh, the marginal product of capital is equal to the um, slope of this uh, break-even capital line. Um, so now we can ask. So this is a condition, this is a necessary condition for the consumption maximizing level of uh, capital. Okay, so we can ask now, in our diamond growth model and our overlapping generations model, is uh, the market decentralized version of, uh, of capital at steady state, is it equal to the uh, golden rule level of capital? And the answer is no. And in fact, it can be either more or less. Okay. So if the, um, if the market level of steady state capital, physical capital per unit of human capital, is less than the golden rule rate of capital, then we can't really improve the outcome. Why is that? It says the people are saving too little. Um, and the only way we can change, suppose, you know, time starts to, or, you know, we're, we're seeing this steady state going along and now the social planner come in, comes in and wants to change things. The only way we can do that is to sort of force people to save more. But if we force people to save more, we're making them worse off because they're already making sort of the, um, optimal, uh, choice. So when we force them to save more, we're sort of hurting them. They would, they would like to save less, but we're forcing them to save more. Okay. Um, so, you know, what's going to happen? I should be careful here. Okay. We're forcing them to save more. So they're going to consume less in when they're young. And then since they saved more when they're old, the rate of return on capital is lower, right? The rental rate of capital is lower when they're old. So they're actually getting less return than they otherwise would have. So they're actually harmed in both generations. We're, we're giving them less consumption when they're young, and we're also giving them less consumption when they're old. Okay, so um, those people are just worse off. So if, uh, if the market level of capital is too low, if the savings rate is too low, then we can't, as a social planner, can't really do anything. And that's the situation in the neoclassical growth model, always, since always the, the, um, the market level of capital and steady state is always less than the golden rule level. So there's nothing we can do as planners to, to help the situation there. However, 
in this model, in the diamond overlapping generation model, sometimes savings are too high. Okay, so depending on you know the particular functional form of of uh, of the production function and the savings rate, uh, we can actually have people saving more than we than than they should to maximize the uh, level of consumption. Okay, if that's the case, then actually as a social planner, we can do something. Okay, what would we do? Well, let's suppose that F prime of the market allocation of capital steady state is less than F prime of little k gr, the golden rule level of capital. That implies that people are saving too much. There's too much capital in steady state. Um, so we're here in the market equilibrium. Now suppose that the planner is going to go in and force young people to save less than they otherwise would have. They want to save more, but we're going to force them to save less. Okay. So what that does is it gives them more consumption than they otherwise would have had at, when they're young. And then in the next period, because we're moving to this golden rule level of capital, the rate of return is also higher than they expected. And, um, and it turns out that that's the rate of, you know, that level, given this rate of return, that's the level of savings that actually ended up maximizing their overall lifetime consumption. Uh, given their preferences. So, I mean, we've given them more consumption when they're young, and we're also giving them the optimal level of consumption when they were old, uh, given this new interest rate. So basically we're making one generation better off when they're young and making every generation moving forward better off because we're now at this consumption maximizing level of, uh, of savings. Okay, so how do we do this magic trick? How did that, how did that work? How did that magic trick work? Okay, so loosely, market rates of return are, are too low relative to the growth rate of, uh, of population and technology. So um, why, why is that? It's because actually the market only has one way of saving. It's that young people save and then they, get a, uh, they rent their savings to firms when they're, when they're old. But the social planner has sort of another way of saving that is not available to, um, to agents in the model. And what's that? It's this weird sort of Ponzi scheme-like way of saving where whenever the market, uh, whenever the planner takes a unit of consumption from the young, excuse me, from the, yeah, from the young and gives it to the old, then uh, for every one unit that's taken from the young, the old can get n plus g units. Do you see why? It's because uh, um, I should be a little bit careful here. For every one unit that's taken from the young, the old can get n units. In fact, I should cross this out because I actually don't think it's quite right. Because we're, we're talking about people here, right? Not technology. So actually, when I change this slide, I'm going to cross it out here in this one. Yeah relative to n, not to n plus g. Um, yeah, so I mean, you know, each generation is bigger, right? So if you take one unit away from the young, you can give one plus n units to the, uh, the old because there's less of them, okay? And, um, you know, we, the reason why that's not available to agents is because transfers from the young to the old, well, the old can't pay the young back the next period because they're dead. You see what I'm saying? So only the planner can do that because we're standing outside of this economy. So we're taking, taking away from the young today, giving it to the old, and then how are we going to pay back the young? Well, when they're old, we're going to take away from the next generation of the young and give it to the old. Um, so if N is big relative to R, then the social planner can sort of use that, um, that additional method of saving or additional method of, of transferring to sort of um, improve outcomes forever. Now this sort of point about taking from the old uh, young and giving to the old is very closely related to real world pension funding. So um, you probably have heard that, you know, as long as the population is growing, this transfer from the young to the old is available to a society, right? So I mean, after World War II, there's this baby boom. Well, isn't that great? We can fund these great pensions because there's lots of people working. They can give some of their output to older workers. 
But the problem is when your, um, your population is growing less fast, then you don't have this, uh, this mechanism sort of becomes less available. If um, n is very small, then it's unlikely that n is going to be greater than r. So let's, let's take a look at, this is now I think one of the last slides, let's take a look at sort of our equilibrium level of steady state capital per unit of human capital in the Cobb-Douglas log utility version of our model. If you'll recall from a few slides ago, it looks like this. What happens if we're chugging along a steady state, then suddenly n decreases, okay? So the rate of, uh, the rate of population growth decreases. Well, it looks to me like this K star is gonna go up, right? So this one plus N is going down. Doesn't that mean that K star goes up? So does that mean that K star grows? Wait, that's weird, isn't it? Wait a second, so we're, we're decreasing the number of people in the future, and yet the production, the capital available to the economy is going up? Isn't that weird? Well, it's not that weird, right? So what's the intuition here? The intuition is that there's a certain amount of capital in the economy, and this is capital per unit of human capital, right? So if there's less people in the future, it doesn't mean that there's more capital. It means there's more capital per unit of human capital. So in a sense, what's happening here is that the, um, is that, uh, is that the capital stock might be growing at a smaller rate or it might even be shrinking. So, you know, suppose that this N uh, turns negative, that's fine. There's nothing stopping N from turning negative. That means the population is shrinking, okay? In fact, I probably should have motivated it that way. So why would it be that capital is growing? Well, capital's not growing. It's just growing per person and the number of people is falling. So, um, so capital per unit of human capital uh, might very well be growing, even as the capital stock is falling, as the economy is degrowing. So uh, let's say n less than zero, degrowth. Right, that's become a very popular uh, term these days. Little talking point: a way to combat climate change is degrowth if our economy stopped growing. All right, so that's really all I have to say about this model. Um, you know, I guess it's somewhat more interesting than the neoclassical growth model uh, because you can get these very unusual things happening. Uh, there can be multiple equilibria. The government might have a role um, in terms of savings. Interestingly, the role is people is forcing people to save less rather than more, which is a somewhat unusual uh, implication. But uh, that's it. So um, in all of the models we've looked at so far, all the growth models, the ultimate growth rate is basically, especially the growth rate per capita is given by G, the exogenous growth rate of technology. It seems kind of boring to think about, you know, to take all the time to write down these models, these elaborate mathematical models. And then at the end of the day, what's the growth rate? Something that we've just assumed in exogenous growth of technology of uh, productivity. So, uh, Next time we're gonna look at an endogenous growth model um, where technology is gonna grow based on sort of R&D investments and it's gonna be sort of optimal decisions in the economy that are leading the economy to grow essentially forever, which is kind of interesting, something interesting to think about. Can the economy grow forever? There's been a lot of research about this actually in the last 10 years, I would say. Um, some people are saying that productivity is not, it may be slowing down, it may not be slowing down, productivity growth, but the amount that we're investing in R&D is growing a lot. So, you know, per R&D worker, per, per hour of R&D, um, it could be the technology is actually, you know, we're getting sort of decreasing returns to uh, R&D investment. So, you know, we'll, we'll maybe think about that a little bit next time. Chapter three is a long chapter. You don't have to read the entire chapter. Uh, I'm gonna focus on sub, uh, these uh, subsections 3.4 and 3.5. Um, that's what's gonna be on the exam. So uh, 
Yeah, that's it.